Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I think the last time I, uh, I came to, what was it, 2013? 20, 2013 was the last time I came to WeShare. And we, if any of you came that year, we built um, a kind of prototype wiki house outside. So what I want to talk about this evening is not the wiki house project that much, but I'd like to kind of give you a bit of an update on, um, if you like, what we've been doing in the last year or so, which is the kind of iceberg beneath the water. Um, which is building some of the um, infrastructures that we believe have to come behind digitizing and transforming the way we make um, cities. Um, so uh, I'm going to start by going backwards, not forwards. Um, if we look back through history uh, and generalize about technologically driven revolutions, um, a really interesting pattern emerges, um, which is that we see that almost always there is a gap in time between the invention of the disruptive technology um, and the actual change, the actual revolution. And there's a gap of several years, which is this kind of Wild West period where a few big corporates come in and make a lot of noise, but actual adoption is very, very low. So um, interesting examples um, of this um, include... Um, slides to catch up. Um, Uh, and I should say, by the way, that, that uh, what, what, what the gap is waiting for, the difference, if you like, is, is waiting for open standards, open standards and open infrastructures. So we have this gap where a few companies come in and then um, nothing really happens until you introduce open standards and open infrastructures. So between the invention of the steam locomotive, it took them 45 years to standardize time, which is interesting because time was only invented, uh, if you like, standardized because of the railways. Um, at the advent of electrification, it took them a huge amount of time before um, they standardized voltages and came up with the idea of um, a national grid um, uh, that it ran on. This is absolutely my favorite. So there's a 26-year gap between the invention of the motor car and the invention of the white line. Right? And white line is possibly one of my favorite design innovations in, in all of history because it costs almost nothing, but the whole economy runs on it. Um, Incredibly, it took 138 years to come up with the ISO container um, for uh, ISO container standard, which again, most of our economy runs on today. And of course, probably the most famous piece of civic infrastructure of our lifetimes, um, which is the World Wide Web. And depending how you, uh, how you look at the history of the internet, there's something like a 20-year gap um, for the World Wide Web uh, before Tim Berners-Lee created that. Um, and of course, now we're at the advent of this next industrial revolution which, of course, is surrounded by huge amounts of hyperbole. It's the confluence of a bunch of things we do understand coming together into something that we don't understand. But it's been termed now um, the fourth industrial revolution, or if you're feeling really trendy, Industry 4.0. Um, because people like to give things names like that, don't they? Um, and in a nutshell, I don't, I don't really think it's hyperbole to call it an industrial revolution, in the sense that it is not just a technological or commercial transition. It involves the same level of social, political, economic upheaval um, that we've experienced with previous industrial revolutions. So this is the kind of map of the industrial revolutions from the kind of the, the blacksmiths, the local craftspeople um, producing vernacular designs, the dark satanic mills, Henry Ford's supply chain, the digitization of that with things like Toyota and Ford, and then the fourth industrial revolution. If, that, of course, if, if this seems outrageous, think about Airbnb. Think about uh, electrical energy. That's the, the clear direction of travel. Um, and so what happens when we start talking about cities? What does this mean for cities? Well, we also at the same time have this insanely huge development challenge in the 21st century, which is climate change, urbanization. And when you actually do the maths on the, piece of, uh, uh, on the back of an envelope, you realize that between now and 2050, we have to build a city the size of New York every five weeks just to keep up. Like, it's completely immense, impossible development challenge that, that um, our generation faces. Um, and yet what's happening is that basically our 20th century construction systems are obsolete. And I don't just mean the construction methodologies, but really the whole stack through from the way that we invest in cities, the speculative real estate model driving it, through to the um, unaffordability and, and the level of debt involved. Um, but also our technologies are also pretty obsolete, and we haven't really changed them that much for a few hundred years. So it's worth thinking about um, the life of a building. And the weird thing about buildings today is that when we produce a building, 
pretty much every time we do it from scratch. So if you're going to procure a building, what lies in front of you is this huge gap, this huge unknown. And so what you do is you fill this gap with a bunch of expert professionals, each operating in their own specialized silos. But of course, in order to then navigate the gap, you then have to pay them a huge amount of money um, to spend their time trying to get information out of each other's heads. Uh, and they do this, of course, by producing drawings and sending those drawings, and then somebody else versions them and sends them, sends them back. And we're all familiar with this, right? It's that thing, you know, when you end up, it's like, like version one, final version, final, final version. No, no, really final version this time, right? We, we, we know this trail of tears. And of course, sometimes you call up and you've got a, cost, a, a quantity surveyor sucking their teeth down the phone, and no one has a clue how much the building's going to cost or how it's going to perform. Um, and of course, what this leads to is a huge amount of fragmentation in the supply chain and a huge uh, breakdown of trust. So actually, if you follow an architect around, um, most of their day isn't spent designing buildings. It's spent on the phone, shuffling liability at other professionals. Right? Um, on e most buildings are designed in email inboxes. And this has a huge cost. It's, it's estimated to be about 20% of the cost of a building, which magnified across the whole UK construction industry is 20.6 billion pounds every year, which, just to put that in perspective, is enough to build 228 hospitals every year, or to build the entire housing quota of the UK on its own. Um, magnify that into the future, and supposedly where the construction industry is going to be in um, 2025, and you get a kind of stupid number like three trillion. Um, but the other cost uh, uh, where we feel this isn't just in terms of money, it's also that it, we come up with these bizarre procurement methods designed to isolate and protect um, clients from risk, and that creates this race to the bottom in terms of quality and performance. And that has a cost in terms of human well-being, but it also has a cost, as we tragically found out a few weeks ago in the UK, it has a cost in terms of actual human life, um, th th these bad procurement models. Um, and the other big cost of that is it means that the only people who can afford to develop are these speculators. And so this is a graph of who builds our homes in the UK. And in the UK, it's a super, super centralized industry. It's centralized in a lot of countries. The UK is especially centralized. Half the homes in the UK are built by just 10 companies. Um, and this is the kind of urbanism that they're producing. And this is the kind of housing crisis that we're now replicating in pretty much every major developed economy, these failed consumer neighborhoods. Um, and so the story of the 20th century has been all about that those sectors, the story of public-private. But all along, there's, there's been this other end of the graph, which is the long tail, which is many, many small players, what we would term the citizen sector, um, which is a very, very different housing economy. Because these are people who want homes as places to live, and they, want, and they can build affordably. The problem is, um, Although we can look at this sector and go, oh my god, it's, it's fundamentally more democratic, it's fundamentally more affordable, it's fundamentally more politically popular, um, there's a problem. And uh, the problem is, as any sensible person will tell you, it's too damn difficult. Right? Long tails are really, really hard to scale. They're not investable, they're not regulatable. And of course, duh, that's where digitization comes in. Right? That's what we've been looking at over the last 10 or 20 years, which is the shift from big models of centralized production to um, uh, unlocking long tails. So, of course, Wikipedia, YouTube, we all know the examples. Twitter is the world's biggest journalism network. Airbnb, of course, is, whether you like it or not, is the world's biggest hotel. Um, and that's not magic, that's just digitization. Um, so here's the question. Why hasn't it already happened to the way that we build? Well, one of the answers to that question is that um, all the, all the companies who make design software, um, firstly, our CAD programs were designed around paper. So what we really did is we took the paper process and digitized it. We'd, or rather, we put it on computers. We didn't digitize it. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is that uh, all the companies who make the software, they primarily make their money by selling software to the existing industries. So you get this kind of point where we bring technological innovation, which is like putting alloy wheels onto a horse and cart. And so nothing has really changed. The, the kind of the, the shape of the, uh, of, of kind of the day-to-day -day life of producing a building hasn't really changed that much. Um, in a much more sensible world, how would we do it? 
Well, the first thing we would do is we establish the idea we would kill the file. So the idea of files would be gone. We would operate in purely in web-based data, and the, we'd establish the first principle, which is that every building should exist as a repository of data, and that repository of data would be owned by the owner of the building throughout the whole building's life. It seems pretty sensible, doesn't it?、Um, so that's our kind of first first step. And then that data can then be modified and versioned by anyone during the building's life. That's not radical. That's GitHub, right? It's already how we work, how how we've been producing software for quite a long time.、Um, the next thing that we would do is, what if we could take that knowledge, which we currently have to spend hours and hours negotiating and fighting out of professionals' heads, and we could turn it into rules? We could digitize and automate that knowledge. Well, we can. Um, and the technology's—it's、uh, called parametric design. So, as an example, take something we all understand. If I say the word chair,、um, you can imagine something in your head that has a certain grammar to it. Well, we can actually write that grammar as code. So things like it's got a seat, it's got legs,、um, and you can actually write that as a kind of as a logic flow, as a series of rules、um, that say, okay, this is how you build up the various elements,、um, and it, it defines the relationships with each other. Um, and the result of that is something like this, which is、um, so. Of course, you can change the basic variables of a chair, and so this is what we call a pattern. Like a chair is a standard recognizable pattern. One chair may differ from another chair, but if I ask a child what's that, they will say it's a chair.、Um, and so we can take this design knowledge instead of、uh, designers redrawing it every single time and reinventing the wheel every time. We can literally turn it into code. Now, what's really powerful、um, is that, of course, once you can put that onto the web,、um, you can do really exciting things with it. So, again, this isn't new.、Um, Christopher Alexander wrote a book、uh, in the 1970s called *A Pattern Language*, in which he basically did all the theory for this without computers,、um, and it was hugely influential in the, in the world of computing.、Um, the idea that essentially all the built environment—he did it by studying cities and realized that the whole built environment around us is driven by rules and, and, and codes and language. So if we can take these bots, at the moment they're tied to offline proprietary software. But if we can take these bots and we can open source that language into the web, we can do something extraordinary because we can get the bots to start speaking to each other. This is what we call a pattern web. So this is, becomes this exponentially powerful piece of open knowledge, where we can solve deeply complex problems、um, by uh, effectively hook, hooking, hooking these things.、Um, Together, and so you can pull down on real data as you design. So this is the basic idea: is to say, well, what if you hook those two things together? So let's say you've got your building information repository, and you can pull down on any relevant data live as you go. Now, again, this isn't, you know, radical. It's 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 just hyperlinking. It's what Tim Berners-Lee calls the semantic web.、Um, but essentially, what you're creating is an open-source coding language for the built environment. So that chair can ask floor a question, and floor can ask chair a question like, "How much do you weigh?"、Um, without human interference, if you like. And again, this bit isn't new either. So the, even as early as the 1980s, companies like Boeing and Rolls Royce were using this sort of approach called knowledge-based engineering、um, to deal with these multidisciplinary, big, complex problems like how you design an aeroplane, which allowed them to apply artificial intelligence to these difficult problems. But of course, they did it within clo big closed shops. We've 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 never taken this software out and let it be free and out on the web before.、Um, so that's really exciting, and that's basically what we're working on. So for the last year or so,、um, we've been working on what, and I, and I apologise for the term, but I'm going to go for it anyway. A, what we call a smart supply chain for buildings. So it, it, what it looks like is something a bit more like this. I don't have a full demo here today, but what you can effectively do. Is you're working in browser and you're it, you're within the rules if you like, so it's, it it won't let you break the rules. And what it's doing in the background is live calculating every screw. It's an algorithm is writing every detail, every joint.、Um, it can pull down on any data set that it can find to calculate, for example, the environmental impact of your building. So it's an incredible level of transparency to be able to see the impact of your decisions、um, as you're designing, and then straight away to then be able to connect to Um, this distributed network of small local manufacturers、um, to produce it, because what that does, of course, is it spits out cutting files,、um, which, sure, at the moment,、um, 
you know, the, the, early, the first prototype of BuildX will only really be running the WikiHow system, but in the future we expect all, all building products to be used in this way. Um, and so, yeah, it, it spits out the cutting files instantaneously. You can go and um, get them manufactured on a CNC machine. Um, yeah, for now, it's still using IKEA-style instructions. Um, and this is the bit some of you might have seen uh, of WikiHow. So this is a, um, a farmhouse that was built in uh, Warwickshire a year or, s or two ago. Um, and what's really, really interesting about this is that actually there are no construction professionals in this video. This is just the farmer and their friends and us and some of our friends coming up there. And in a few days, they're able to build a house which, when you measure it, is um, good within sort of seven millimeters of precision. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit here. Uh, needless to say, you know, it's not that they're, no one's built one to passive house yet, um, but it's uh, really high performance as standard. Um, and that's where this idea of new normal, like designing down the thresholds, making it simple. Um, and all that technology is open source, by the way, the, the WikiHouse technology, etc. cetera. Um, so fine, that, there's, there's a kind of brief uh, glimpse into to how we think we might be designing in the future. But um, what I'd like to do is just share five other ways that in future this kind of approach could be a total game changer for our cities and for the built environment. Um, the first one, of course, is the idea of um, parametric or smart products. So again, in the future, we think every single building system, not just WikiHouse, um, every single building system and every single building product will be bought like this. It's going to save huge amounts of work in terms of sending PDFs around on emails to order things. Um, it just sends manufacturing files straight. And the really crucial thing is that if, if you're a company who sells uh, a product, for the first time in history, you'll be able to get actual performance data back through the life of that product, which we can't do amazingly at the moment. That just doesn't happen. Um, the second application of this, which we're actually working on, is to digitize um, the regulations that shape our built environment. So this is actually a pilot project we're doing with Southwark Council in London. So this is the document that defines the set of rules. If you want to put an extension on the back of your house, so we, you know, we started something simple. Um, if you want to put an extension on the back of your house, um, you've got to fo follow your way through this 24-page document of rules and not get it wrong. And not surprisingly, most people get it wrong. And it's costing, it, 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 citizens hate it, but also it's costing the, the local governments um, hundreds of thousands of pounds um, every year. So we said, okay, what if we could take this human written um, knowledge and we could again turn it into a pattern? So we could take the rules on the left and literally turn them into a human written but machine readable pattern. And that pattern, again, can be maintained by the local government. Um, so it, it is automation, but it's owned by the person who owns that piece of knowledge. Um, and of course, you could plug that straight into BuildX. I'm not going to show. This is a little app we're developing, which um, uh, basically allows people to go on and to check before they put in a planning application whether their scheme is um, compliant with the building codes or not. Um, third thing is building logs. Obviously, you know, seems like a really obvious idea that every owner of a building should have a complete digital repository. Um, so when a part breaks, you can just find your local manufacturer and cut a replacement. Um, oh, this has got exciting all of a sudden. Um, uh, and that's obviously, you know, uh, uh, crucial. Um, the, 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 the next application, I'm going to carry on regardless. Um, <laughs> the next application is, is for us a real, real game changer, which is the moment that you move to um, understanding how our built environment actually performs, and having measurable, trustable metrics for how a building performs over its life, so let's say the energy savings, um, you can do something extraordinary, um, this is good, um, which is that for the, f I, should, I should rewind slightly. At the moment, we all agree we want to build more low energy buildings, right? The only people with an incentive to build more low, uh, to, to put more insulation in the walls, are the people paying the heating bills. Speculative, speculative developers have absolutely no interest in building more sustainable homes because it's not on their, on their bottom line. Not because they're bad people, it's just not on their bottom line. But what if for the first time we could actually predict um, and form smart contracts around the performance of a building over time? 
It means we could move from an investment model in our built environment, which is based on this speculative model, which is investing in、um, draining people's incomes, basically inflating the value of the land underneath their feet, to the idea of investing in the home as a platform over 25 years and recovering those savings at a steady rate, which is something that pension funds、um, are obviously really, really interested in. Um, and the final application, which is obviously where we'd like to work towards, is that many, many cities right now, including cities who say they have no land, actually have lots of land in tiny, small bits of parcels, rooftop zones, etc. But at the moment, that industry is not scalable. So we're really excited. To, we're beginning to kind of work with, and we want to partner with more people to look at how they could do city-scale or regional-scale pilots to unlock these small sites and to line up local building typologies and local lenders to unlock. The citizen sector, and that's basically what we're interested in doing here: is unleashing a new, sustainable, democratic housing economy, a, a housing sector that sits alongside the existing housing sectors,、um, and to prove that it can be can be scalable, it can be investable, and it can be regulatable. But in order to do that, and this is what I'll finish with. What we have to do, you know, everything I've just talked about, is basically. To go back to the beginning of the talk, it's basically white lines, right? It's open, open source infrastructure. The problem is, you know, if we want to have this transition to a circular economy, if we want to have a transition to a distributed model of local sustainable production, we don't get it unless we build the new infrastructures of the 21st century. And the problem is that no one at the moment knows how to invest in those. Our mindset is entirely still locked around. Uh, and this, by the way, is、uh, McKinsey is the absolute go-to people when you need something saying ob- something that's obvious to be said, but with authority. So,、um, <laughs> you know, they said this, right? So, in in a report that they did last year, they said、um, the only reason why the, the the construction space is so backward is simply that no one is willing to put up the upfront investment into the open digital infrastructures, despite the fact that the benefits to society and the economy are insane. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of beyond measurable,、um, and we have this fundamental problem, which is that we have forgotten how to invest in open civic digital infrastructures. Now, actually, you could argue we've never been that good at it, you know. But the story we're still telling ourselves is the story of the public and the public versus private, left versus right, state versus market. And of course, we all know what's happened, which is that over the course of the 20th century, this, you know, the public has shrunk away and the private has grown, and so we look to the private to do. Almost everything, and then in the 1970s, along came this other thing called the third sector, which is NGOs and non-profits, and that's great because they spotted the kind of gap、um, it, that, that national states could, could not do. And all along, by the way, there was another thing underneath, which was a thing before a sector was a thing you were allowed to be, right?、Uh, which was the citizen sector, which is people doing stuff for themselves. And it turns out, by the way, if you're talking about care, healthcare, childcare, or elderly care, or housing. The citizen sector is the most important sector out there. And by the way, this is controversial in this space. I don't really believe there ever was such a thing as the sharing economy. I think it was digitization was beginning to unlock and empower the citizen sector. But the doubts we have in our minds about the sharing economy is this question of well, who builds the infrastructures? Because at the moment we look to Silicon Valley to be the only ones putting forward the thing, and then of course they own the infrastructures. And we want a world where companies are big fish, but we don't want a world where companies own the pond, right? We don't want these big monopolies because bad things happen,、um, and we need to persuade these big companies that they can actually be bigger fish if they build build a pond. Um, and so the big question, which I just is an open question because I don't know the answer, but I want to leave with it, is how are we going to find and invent new ways to come together to build the thing in the middle, which is the commons? It's the it's the operating system of our economy. How do we learn how to invest in that? Now we have a few ways going on that I think are kind of interesting. So um, yes. Um, An obvious example is things like op- open source, which is where, where, where individual citizens、um, kind of put in their time.、Um, yes, NGOs may sometimes do this in, in, in micro micro level. So the foundations, you know, part of our funding has come from from people like foundations so far. Although of course we need more.、Um, everyone does, right?、Um, Yeah, public sector used to, but doesn't really doesn't really understand digital well enough to invest in in, in civic infrastructures. 
So this is my first proposal, is that maybe governments could start thinking about creating not just entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial funds, but open infrastructure funds, which would fund startups exclusively on the condition that what they output is open source. Um, to, in other words, to, to, to invest and get in early. Because by the way, that this code doesn't cost that much money. But if you don't invest it, it's just Uber who will come. I mean, you know, Uber, we, we say this all the time, Uber is actually, the code of Uber is actually quite simple. It's just that no one else did it first. Um, and, and, and of course, they have some quite pretty aggressive competition strategies. Um, the other thing is a big shift, which we're beginning to see in the third sector, which is moving from this narrative of just doing good, which is like, you know, kind of obvious. And I'm not saying doing good is bad, by the way. Doing good is good, right? Helping communities, etc. But I think more and more, those big organizations are beginning to realize that just funding philanthropic good things is not going to ever change anything and that we actually need to invest in deep systemic change, and we need to invest in these open digital infrastructures if we want to do that. Um, another one which I think is hardly anyone talks about, and we need to talk all uh, about more and more, is a model which uh, Josh Vial, uh, or Vial, I don't know how you pronounce his name, of, of Inspiral talks about, which is called the capped returns model. So it's a way of inviting investors to build, um, to invest in infrastructure, but when they've had a certain, say, five times the money they put in back, they're, cons they're essentially considered to be bought out so that the, 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 the platform can then just migrate and become part of the commons. It's not got an economic rent-seeking um, shareholders behind it anymore. So it's a way that everyone can win. ICOs, I'm extremely, uh, initial coin offerings, I'm extremely unconvinced about because for obvious reasons, they're just turning into speculation matches. Um, and the final one, of course, which we all love to talk about is things like the basic income and the citizen's dividend, which effectively is a way of, again, paying for people's time to do what they actually want to do, which is not to make money, it's to solve the deep systemic problems that we face. Thank you very much for putting up with my <laughs> brain dump. <laughs>